This is what we're all after. Year after year, season after season, our goal is in the crosshairs. But to get to this point, there's a process that begins a lot earlier, way back in summer or even last fall, right after last season. Hi, I'm Dan Small. Welcome to Deer Hunt 2010. What does Wisconsin's gun deer season mean to you? For some of us, the goal is a trophy buck. For others, it's putting food on the table. And for all, it's the experience of another deer hunt. Time spent in the woods with family and friends in pursuit of the white-tailed deer. When we hunt, we interact with the wild, we create memories, and we participate in a long tradition, our hunting heritage. We'll be sharing a lot of information throughout this program, but in case you miss some of it or have additional questions, the Department of Natural Resources Call Center is available from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. Operators are standing by now to answer your questions. You can also chat online with DNR customer service representatives. Go to the DNR homepage, click on Contact Us, and follow the prompts. How well do you know Wisconsin's whitetails? Grab a pen and paper and get ready to take our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. We'll ask you eight questions during the show and give you the answers at the end. See how well you know our deer. Now here's question number one. How tall is an adult Wisconsin whitetail at the shoulder? A. 24 to 30 inches. B. 36 to 42 inches, or C, 48 to 54 inches. You've probably got November 20th circled on your calendar, but the hunt begins well before that third Saturday in November. Our goal in this program is to review what every hunter needs to know and share some tips that might be new even for the most skilled veterans among you. But whether you're a neophyte hunter or a seasoned veteran, you want to be well prepared before you hunt. Take the right stuff for wherever you plan to hunt. And that means clothing and boots that'll keep you warm and dry. Your outer layer must be blaze orange, of course, and when in doubt, replace any faded garments with bright new ones. Take along several layers of blaze orange clothing in case the weather changes or in case you want to remove a layer to field dress a deer or drag it out. Lightweight, waterproof boots if you plan to walk a lot. Boots with a lot of insulation if you plan to sit all day and a boot dryer to ensure you have dry boots the next morning. Long underwear, warm socks, gloves, and a couple different hats for a change in weather should complete your clothing list. And now here are some items we're all going to need. A rifle, muzzle loader, or shotgun, and the appropriate ammo. And take along a gun cleaning kit for emergencies in the field. If your rifle has a detachable clip, buy an extra one. You'll need a license and back tag holder and a zip tie or piece of string to attach your tag to a deer copy of the deer hunting regulations, and something for marking a blood trail in case you have to track a wounded deer. You'll need a good sharp knife for field dressing. A small knife will do. Gutting gloves will keep most of the blood off your hands and clothes, but don't leave them in the woods. Carry a heavy-duty plastic bag for the heart, liver, and kidneys if you save those parts. A small flashlight, a compass, and a pair of compact binoculars. You'd be surprised at how many deer you see with binoculars that you don't see with the naked eye. And by the way, never use your rifle scope to scan the woods or check out another hunter. There's nothing more disconcerting than to be looking through your binoculars at another hunter across the field and see him pointing his rifle at you. Most hunters would consider those items essentials, but here are some optional items you might want to carry. Some air-activated hand warmers, a scent control product, and perhaps an attractor scent. If you're hunting private land, a good pair of brush cutters or a saw. On state land, of course, you can cut only dead vegetation. You might want a deer call, or a pair of rattling antlers, or a rattling bag. Other optional items include a camera, a whisk broom for brushing snow off your stand, two-way radios or a cell phone, and a handheld GPS unit. 
some reflectors for marking the trail to your stand so you can find it in the dark. Toilet paper, paper towels, or a small hand towel, a lunch, and something to drink. You can put extra clothes and items you don't want to get wet in plastic bags like these zip back bags and seal the air out to save space. And if you hunt from a tree stand, you'll need steps or a ladder, a full body harness, and a rope to lift your gun up into your stand. Carry all this stuff in a small backpack so you don't have to fumble through your pockets to find something. If you hunt with a group, you'll have help dragging out a deer. If you hunt alone, though, you might want to consider a drag system like this load breaker or a deer carrier like this Lumens Transporter, or maybe an ATV where it's legal to use them. Put all these items on a checklist and keep that in your back tag holder or some other place where you know you can find it. It's important to sight in your rifle, shotgun, or muzzle loader every year. You should have done it by now, but if you haven't, there are sight in clinics at ranges throughout the state this weekend. And some ranges, like McMiller Sports Center in the Southern Kettle Moraine, will be open all next week. It's best to sight in well in advance to avoid the last minute rush and make sure your firearm is operating properly. If you shoot a bolt action rifle, at the very least you can remove the bolt, put the rifle on a rest and sight down the bore to see if your scope is still lined up with the target at 25 and 100 yards. Here's question number two in our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. Which of a deer's senses is the weakest? A. Sight, B. Smell, or C. Hearing. I hunt up north in Bayfield County, on land I've hunted for 35 years. I know the property well and I know where I'm likely to see deer. No doubt some of you hunt the same place every year. Some of us will be hunting private land, some public land. Some go to different places every year, and some of you might not have a clue yet where you'll be hunting. So where do you hunt? Where do you hunt? Wisconsin is one of the top states for deer hunting, and there are deer throughout the state. But we all want to hunt where there's a good concentration of them, and where we're more likely to be successful. Wherever you go, drive carefully. A lot of us will be on the road on the Thursday and Friday before gun season. And by the way, if you're driving a long distance, make sure your car or truck is ready for winter before you hit the road. It's also a good idea to get a health checkup before you hunt, especially if you don't work out regularly or if you haven't had a checkup in the last year or two. If you're looking for a new place to hunt, there are over 500,000 acres of state-owned land open to hunting. The DNR website is a good place to start. Go to the home page, click on maps, and you'll be able to find maps of public land. One issue of concern is the decline in hunter numbers. Wisconsin is losing hunters at a faster rate than we're replacing them. Currently, the state has three ways to recruit new hunters. And the first is a series of youth hunts, including the youth deer hunt in October. The second is the Learn to Hunt program. And the third is the Mentored Hunt. And that was introduced just last year. Here's DNR Warden Todd Schaller to tell us more about the Mentored Hunting opportunity. Hunting and tradition go hand in hand. Wisconsin's Mentored Hunting Law makes it easy to pass on your hunting traditions to the next generation of hunters. I'm Conservation Warden Todd Scheller. Interest in mentored hunting continues to grow as families look to involve their children in family traditions. This is true when family and friends gather to hunt and share the Thanksgiving holiday. Children are our future. Spend time with them, share your knowledge and love for the outdoors and wildlife. It's an important step in creating a lifelong interest in the natural world and the hunting sports. Hunting is great exercise and a healthy activity. It teaches responsibility, planning, and good judgment. Wisconsin's Mentored Hunting Law provides opportunity to experience hunting under careful, controlled conditions, designed to provide a safe learning experience. Special rules apply. The new hunter does not need a hunter safety education certificate. Only one firearm or bow is allowed between the new hunter and the mentor, and they must be within arm's reach at all times. The mentor must be at least 18 and have a valid hunting license. A person can only mentor one new hunter at a time. All other hunting rules for open seasons, firearm restrictions, and bag limits apply. Many of today's hunters, including myself, got their start thanks to a parent, a relative, or a family friend who took the time to teach them what they need to know to be successful and ethical hunters today. Like you, 
My mentor passed on skills I still use. He also shared with me a strong ethic, taught me the importance of conservation, and respect for game laws. The DNR is working hard to recruit new hunters, and mentored hunting is a great first step. This is your chance to do today what someone once did for you. Help a new hunter experience the excitement you felt on your first hunt. Give them their own story to share around the dinner table. There's more information on mentored hunting on our website, dnr.wi.gov. You'll also find information on other youth hunting opportunities and for organizations interested in sponsoring youth hunting events. Thanks for listening and good hunting. Here's question number three in our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. How fast can a deer run? A. 10 miles an hour. B. 20 miles an hour. Or C. 30 miles an hour or more. In a few minutes, we're going to look at some typical Wisconsin deer habitat and suggest how you might improve your chances for a successful hunt wherever you plan to go. But first, let's get an idea of what the deer herd looks like around the state this fall. Deer biologists tell us, and you should know this as a hunter, that deer don't move very far from where they're born. A deer's home range is about a square mile or two at best. We can't tell you exactly where in that square mile or two the deer will be in your area, but Department of Natural Resources biologists can tell you what deer numbers look like in the area you hunt or where you're thinking of hunting this year. Here's DNR big game ecologist Keith Warnke with a forecast for this year's hunt. Whether it's a flock of geese circling the decoys, a crisp morning of bow hunting, or Wisconsin's gun deer season, fall is my favorite time of year. I'm Keith Warnke, the deer program coordinator for Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. In the next week, hundreds of thousands of deer hunters are going to be preparing for the Wisconsin traditional gun deer season, one of the biggest events in our state. Over the decades, many things have changed, but the heart-pounding sensation when a deer suddenly appears is a constant. Many of our deer hunting traditions are timeless as well. It's a time when family and friends gather at hunting camps to share old stories and make new ones. Each year, the passing of time always gives a snapshot of the old timers training the new hunters, who in turn become veterans and recruit another generation of hunters. It's through this strong sense of place and community that the hunting camp calls us back each year. As always, some hunters will get a deer, others will not, but being part of the experience is the cornerstone of our tradition. Wisconsin deer hunters have a lot to be proud of when it comes to deer hunting. We've been at or near the top of the national rankings in Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young whitetail entries for years, and we intend to stay there. More than 600,000 Wisconsinites take part in our great tradition each year. Keeping a strong deer herd and a strong deer hunting tradition are the top priorities for DNR. So, what does the 2010 deer season look like? Deer populations across the state are not at the record levels of a decade ago, but for the most part are strong and healthy. Because of this, there is less antlerless deer hunting opportunity this year. For this reason, we expect deer harvest will be lower than in the record years. Winter severity was fairly mild across most of the state, with good deer survival and spring fawn production. Indications from summer deer surveys show that fawn recruitment into the fall population was near the long-term average throughout the state. This is welcome news after two years of depressed fawn production. Statewide, Buck harvest should be similar to last year, but will vary with hunting conditions and deer movement. What to expect in your hunting area? Keep in mind, deer populations can vary greatly, even in areas you may be familiar with. Deer distribution and patterns shift frequently due to a number of factors, such as land use practices, hunting pressure, changes in the habitat, weather conditions, and the presence of predators or other disturbances. The best information comes from your hunting experience and scouting and from local hunters and landowners. The same stand that has yielded deer in the past may no longer be productive, so it's good to have a number of options and be ready to adapt during the hunt. Hunting methods have changed and access to land and the deer has changed over time. As a result, deer behavior has changed during the hunting season. The use of stands has increased over the years and has proven to be a successful tactic for many hunters. 
but at the same time, fewer deer drives may result in less deer movement during the hunting hours. Remember to check the deer regulations booklet and be sure you know and understand the rules and deer tagging requirements where you hunt. If you have questions, call the DNR Customer Service Call Center at 888-936-7463. The call center is staffed seven days a week from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. Make sure you enjoy this fall's gun deer hunt. Have fun and above all, hunt safely. Good luck. Deer movement patterns change from year to year in response to changes in their habitat. As the forest matures or is cut, as crops are harvested or rotated, and as housing or industrial development encroach on their territory. They may also change their behavior in response to the weather, pressure from predators or hunting pressure. As a starting point, check out areas that have held deer in the past. Let's face it, this is not an exact science. Some of us are going to get a deer this year and some are not. It's especially true if you're strictly a buck hunter. Even in the year when Wisconsin hunters killed the greatest number of bucks ever during the gun season, only about one hunter in four registered a buck. That was back in 1995. Last year, our buck harvest was about half what it was in 95, and only 107 shot a buck. If you factor in antlerless deer, even in the best of years, less than half of all hunters will tag a deer. But we still all have the opportunity to hunt. Even in years when deer are more abundant, bagging a deer is not a slam dunk. But you can improve your odds, and that's what we're trying to help you do in this show. Where you find deer is a function of natural deer biology and behavior and human alteration of deer habitat. In the big woods country of northern Wisconsin, deer have lots of room to roam. But you can narrow down your search by locating feeding and bedding areas and travel routes between them. In agricultural areas, which includes most of southern Wisconsin, the progress of the corn harvest will have a huge impact on where the deer will be come November 20th. And no matter where you hunt, if you know the escape routes that deer use when they're threatened, you can put yourself and your partners in a better position for a shot. If you're a trophy hunter, you know the buck you're after is one that survived last season. And you may have been scouting since last winter. You know where he beds and where he feeds and what trails he uses. And who knows, you might have found one of his sheds. If you're a meat hunter and you're happy to take any deer, it amounts to the same thing. You have to know where the deer are in order to shoot one. Here's question number four in our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. Bucks communicate by emitting scent from which glands? A. Orbital B. Tarsal C. Pineal D. All of the above. This old field is a typical bedding area, and other good bedding areas include south or east facing slopes because they're normally sheltered from the prevailing winds and they're exposed to the morning sun. After the rut, though, mature bucks tend to bed in dense brush, cedar thickets, and other places most hunters won't go. If you can locate deer trails between bedding areas and food sources such as ag fields and oak or beech woodlots, these are good places to set up a stand. Wisconsin is one of the top states for deer numbers, harvest, and hunter success rates. But have you ever wondered how we got there? It took years of research and sound wildlife management. DNR research can help us understand more about deer numbers, biology, movement patterns, age distribution in the herd, the ratio of bucks to does, and other things of interest to hunters. This year, the DNR is launching a $2 million research effort aimed at learning more about Wisconsin's deer herd and fine-tuning our deer management practices. Let's take a look at what's planned with University of Wisconsin professor Tim Van Dielen. We're starting three big research projects. Two of those will become very visible this winter. Uh, the first two are going to be a study of buck mortality. Uh, the second will be a study of fawn recruitment. There are two study areas, one in the North Woods, one in a representative farmland area. Those will be uh, big telemetry studies, so lots of radio collars, lots of trapping this winter. Then the third study is also beginning, and that's in the design phase. And that's looking at the relationship between different levels of deer density and their impacts on forest. And so the first two studies are primarily to support 
improvements in the population estimation techniques. And then the second study is to help us understand whether our goals are responsible or not. The predators in Wisconsin have been changing over time. There's been an indication that we've got more black bears than we thought we did. We're uh, continuing to try and understand black bear numbers and certainly we've had an increasing wolf population. That's prompted some concerns among deer hunters and managers that they may be having more of an impact on the deer population than, than what we thought. So a big emphasis of both of the telemetry studies is to look at what fraction of the natural mortality we can actually attribute to these predators and whether or not we think that's changed over time. Um, we've done some preliminary work looking at predator impacts and seeing if we can find a signal for those changes in the age structure information that we get from the harvested deer, but that's really an indirect measure. One of the things we really need to do is to go in with radio collars and try and estimate those things directly. Winter trapping is how we expect to get our hands on the animals, both to put ear tags on them and to put radio collars on them. We use a variety of traps. The two most common traps are versions of a big box trap. One is made out of plywood. The other is made out of uh, iron pipe that supports uh, a netting. We also use rocket nets. And because we're attempting to cut, catch large numbers of bucks, we may also turn to having um, researchers in a tree stand trying to dart these animals. You can be much more selective that way. So we, we'll get up and running with that this winter. Most of the research uh, funding is coming from the DNR through their Pittman-Robertson program. Uh, they took that money to the University of Wisconsin and leveraged some additional money. So the, the University of Wisconsin and the DNR are the big partners. And we've turned to the people of Wisconsin for help. So we've, we've been working with local landowners. We've been working with the Conservation Congress, local hunters in both of the study areas to try and get volunteers who might be interested in helping us handle the animals, to get landowners who might be willing uh, to give us access for trapping and for other research activities. And we're looking for partners. The telemetry research studies are going to be conducted over the next five years. The buck mortality study will have four years of field work. The fawn recruitment study will have two years of field work. We're getting started this winter and we'll continue for the next five years. There are ways you can get involved in helping with deer research. One thing you can do is participate in the DNR's Deer Hunter Wildlife Survey. Every time you go out hunting, keep track of the wildlife you see. Not just deer, but turkeys, grouse, predators, anything you see. And then log on to the DNR website, search for deer hunting, and click on Deer Hunter Wildlife Survey. You can even print out a tally sheet to take with you in the field. You can also volunteer to help with some of the field research. Sign up on the DNR website or contact any DNR wildlife biologist. Here's question number five in our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. What influences a buck's antler development? A, the deer's age. B, genetics. C, nutrition. Or D, all of the above. The most effective way to scout for deer, of course, is to spend time in the woods. You'll find deer sign like this fresh rub. But most of us are too busy to be out here every day. So another way to monitor deer activity is to set up a trail camera or two. A trail camera can be your eyes in the woods when you're not there. There are a number of old rubs on the aspen here. It's a good sign that deer have been using this area for a number of years. Trail cameras can help you pattern deer movement and give you an idea of how many deer are in the area and help you identify a deer you might want to hunt. This deer trail comes out of this woodlot. And look at this, here's a fresh scrape and a licking branch nibbled by a buck. Clear evidence that a buck's been using this area. And here's another deer trail that joins the first one and heads into this open area. Now, if you've got a spot like this on private land that you hunt, this would be a perfect place to establish a small food plot or two. Food plots are not considered baiting, which is illegal in some parts of the state. It's too late to do it this year, but you can work up the ground next spring, get a soil test, and plant an appropriate seed mix for the soil type that you have. You can plant several small plots, some with a clover mix to hold deer in the area in spring and summer, and some with a brassica mix for fall planting that'll attract deer during the hunting season.
If you hunt public land, you can focus on natural food plots, such as oak and beechnut woods, or forest clear cuts that have grass and other greens, uh, along with young tree seedlings that attract deer. This is a good location for a tree stand. The woods behind the stand will help hide you, and the stand overlooks an open area where several deer trails converge. If you hunt on private land, put up several stands in advance so you can hunt the downwind side of an area regardless of the wind direction. On public land, set up a stand to take best advantage of the wind and weather pattern on the day you hunt. Elevated stands are the scene of accidents every hunting season. It's easy to slip and fall when it's cold out and you're all bundled up. And every now and then a hunter falls asleep and tumbles out of a stand. But falling from a tree stand is not the only way you can get hurt while hunting. Here's DNR warden Tim Lawhern with some safety tips we all need to keep in mind this season. The most critical thing to know this gun deer season are the four basic rules of firearm safety. You can easily remember those by using the word TAB, T-A-B, and the letter K. T stands for treat every firearm as if it's loaded. Never trust anyone when they hand the firearm to you that it's unloaded. Even though you've seen it unloaded, check it yourself by opening the action and then physically checking the chamber to see if it's loaded. The letter A always stands for always point the muzzle in a safe direction. And that means not at yourself or anybody else. If your muzzle's in a safe direction, even if you have an unwanted discharge, that means that the projectile, the pellets, or the bullet are going to hit some other object than a human being. So always point your muzzle in a safe direction. The letter B stands for be certain of your target and what's beyond it. How do you do that? Never use this as the item that you look at to verify whether or not your target is legal to shoot at. That's what they make binoculars for. You look at this something through this scope and where does your muzzle point? At what you're looking at, which is a violation of the three rules and four rules of firearm safety. So don't use your scope as a pair of binoculars, use binoculars for that purpose. The letter K stands for keep your finger outside the trigger guard until you're ready to shoot. That means alongside the receiver or just alongside the trigger guard, never inside. One third of all our hunting incidents annually are caused by people shooting themselves and what happens is the safety is usually in the off safe position and the figure is inside the trigger guard when the gun goes off. So remember, tab K, treat every firearm as if it's loaded, always point the muzzle in a safe direction, be certain of your target and what's beyond it, and keep your finger outside the trigger guard. Now the only fatality we had last year during our gun deer season happened on opening day, and it was a gentleman hunting from a tree stand. Always raise and lower an unloaded firearm while you're hunting from a tree stand. Never a loaded firearm. In this case, the firearm was loaded and the haul line was attached to the trigger guard. If you're going to attach a haul line, attach it someplace else, anything but the trigger guard itself. I'm Tim Lawhern, Conservation Warden with the Wisconsin DNR, and I approve this message because safe hunting is no accident. If you hunt out of a ground blind, remember 144 square inches of blaze orange must be visible from all sides of the blind if you're hunting on state controlled land. It's a good idea for a blind on private land as well. And if you leave your blind or tree stand on public land during the day, you need to tag it with your name or DNR customer number. Now here's question number six in our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. How long is a whitetail doe's gestation period? A, four months. B, six and a half months. Or C, nine and a half months. Since 2001, when chronic wasting disease was discovered in Wisconsin's deer herd, the DNR has used a variety of strategies to control the spread of CWD. The primary method for controlling CWD is herd reduction. But in order to reduce the herd, the DNR needs to know the status of the deer population each year. One method used to count deer is aerial surveys of randomly selected sites within the CWD zone. Don Bates is the CWD operations supervisor for the DNR's South Central region. We're doing helicopter surveys determining the deer population size in the CWD zone in southwestern Wisconsin. 
we actually go up in the air in a helicopter and do random sampling of square mile sections and count the deer. The primary objective is simply to get a population estimate to see if, if we're bringing the herd down or not. This is a snapshot in time as far as where deer are. In the winter time, these deer with good snow conditions tend to, to group up near food sources. Most of the deer are found in large blocks of woods that are directly adjacent ag fields, either corn stubble or if they're standing corn, the deer tend to move in from about a mile around. We need to do these under full snow conditions. The, the contrast of the dark deer in the light background is essential. They're not easy to pick up. It takes a, a trained eye and uh, we've got uh, trained staff that do this on an annual basis. We generally start surveys under good snow conditions as early in January as we can. This year we're able to start in the first week in January. Depending on cover type, it takes us about 12 to 16 passes uh, to get through a square mile. So um, if it's open ag land, we may be able to do it in five or six passes. It has very little cover. If it's contiguous cover, it takes 12 to 16 passes, about 20 minutes to do a section. We're not flying every section because helicopter uh, surveys are costly and we, we can't afford to fly every section in the CWD management zone, uh, which is 9,000 uh, square miles. Uh, we're flying about 300 sections total. Well, helicopter counting of deer is, is probably as accurate a count as you're gonna get. It's actual physically counting the deer on the landscape. We need an accurate population estimate so that we can base management decisions on that. Our goal in the CWD zone is to reduce the deer herd. We need to know if we're getting there. And once we do get there, we need to continue to monitor the population to see where we go from there. Helicopter surveys are the most expensive way known to count deer. But aerial surveys are a good way to count deer in southern Wisconsin because deer habitat is fragmented and the forest is primarily deciduous with few areas of conifers. Aerial surveys wouldn't work statewide because they're too expensive and there are too many conifers up north. Now here's a look at forecasts for each of the DNR's five regions. Deer management units in the South Central region are classified as either chronic wasting disease or herd control units. Chronic wasting disease or CWD units will have Ernebuck regulations to manage local deer populations in an effort to control the spread of the disease. As the number of consecutive years with Ernebuck regulations continues, some hunters may find the hunt more challenging Overall, buck-to-doe ratios generally increase with Ernebuck regulations, and the percentage of larger, older bucks increases too. Fawn recruitment rates in the South Central region appear to be above average this year. In the Southeast region, deer numbers are still above population goals throughout most management units, and most units are in herd control regulations this year. The exceptions are Unit 69, which is a regular unit, and Units 76A and 77A and B, and part of 77C in Walworth and portions of Waukesha, Racine, and Kenosha counties. These units are in the CWD zone, so they'll have Ernebuck regulations. Fawn recruitment rates were above average in this part of the state this year. In the Northeast region, 2010 will be the second consecutive year without Ernebuck restrictions. Preliminary reports from the Deer Hunter Wildlife Survey show that deer observation rates are higher than last year in the Northeast, and in fact, they're the highest in the state this year. Most units will have herd control regulations. A few areas will be regular units with limited antlerless tags, and parts of Marinette County will have bucks-only regulations. Most units in the West Central region are classified as regular units, as deer numbers are close to current deer population goals. Hunters who wish to tag an antlerless deer in regular units will need to purchase a bonus tag for the unit they're hunting in, in addition to a deer license. Tags are limited in quantity, so act quickly if you want to purchase one. Some regular units are already sold out of antlerless tags. Other units in the region are classified as herd control units with unlimited antlerless tags available. Most herd control units are located in the Cooley, Mississippi River Valley area. 
The northern region paints a different picture as you head from west to east. In the west, deer populations are high and some deer management units are classified as herd control in the area extending from Washburn County to Polk County. Deer populations are currently above goals in these units and early summer deer observations show above average fawn production rates. Areas in the north central portion of the region are classified as regular units with a limited number of antlerless tags for sale. Many units have already sold out of bonus antlerless tags, while there are still some tags available for other units. 19 deer management units, mostly in the far northeast, will have bucks only regulations for both archery and gun hunters in efforts to get deer numbers back toward population goals. You may have heard recently about the CWD vaccine being developed by a Canadian research team. A vaccine might hold promise for helping manage CWD in the future when it's been proven safe and effective. But meanwhile, the state plans to stick with other control measures, namely reducing deer numbers in areas with CWD. Here's question number seven in our Wisconsin Whitetail quiz. A doe must be at least a year old to breed, true or false? Nearly every year, there are a few new regulations that affect deer hunters. Here's DNR Conservation Warden Barb Wolf with a summary of new regulations for this season. One of the first new rules that I want to talk about is the use of telescopic sights on muzzleloaders during the special muzzleloader season. For the last 20 years since we've had a muzzleloader season, hunters were restricted to the use of only aim points or non-magnifying sights on their firearms. This year, you'll be able to use a telescopic sight. Although the muzzleloader is still a primitive one-shot weapon, there's been a great evolution in effective range and the development of ammunition. And having a telescopic sight will make that one shot count. Another rule that's worked its way through the Conservation Congress and spring hearing process has been a change that allows hunters to quarter their deer in the field. A hunter can now divide a deer up into as many as five parts leaving the head attached to one of those parts before registering it. Unlike out west though, what you have to do is make sure that you remove all the parts of the deer, except for the entrails, out of the field and dispose of that properly. Yep. Keep in mind if you're hunting with a group, only one divided deer can be stored or transported at a time prior to registration. There are some new rules for hunters in 19 different deer management units in the northern and northeast part of the state. Those units are buck only in order to get the herd population back up. The antlerless tags that come with an archery license are not valid in these units. So hunters should be aware and check the hunting regulations to make sure they know what the rules are where they're going hunting. There are some exceptions to the buck only rule. First time hunter education graduates, disabled hunters, members of the military on leave or furlough, and those enrolled in the crop damage program may be eligible for an antlerless deer tag. Again, check your regulations. Hunters in the CWD zone will be interested to know that we've liberalized the transportation rules for whole deer carcasses. Deer carcasses may be removed from the CWD zone as long as they are delivered to a deer processing facility or a taxidermist within 72 hours. We can do this because these businesses have waste disposal regulations that prevent the spread of disease. Here's question number eight, the last question in our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. Deer population goals for Wisconsin's deer management units consider which of the following? A, ecological carrying capacity of the landscape. B, social tolerance for deer. C hunting and recreational interests, or D, all of the above. Most of us carry a cell phone nowadays, even in the woods. It's legal to communicate with others in your hunting party by telephone or two-way radio, as long as you don't call someone to come and tag a deer. That you have to do by voice or visual signal. You can call the DNR call center or tip line on your cell phone when you're in the field to ask a question or report a violation. 
We've been showing the call center number on the screen throughout the show. This is the number to call if you have a question about regulations. Call center staffers are available seven days a week from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. and additional staff will be on duty during the gun deer season to answer your questions in English, Spanish, or Hmong. That number is 888-936-7463. You can also start a live chat with the DNR staff person by going to the Contact Us page of the DNR website and following the prompts. The DNR tip line is the number to call to report a violation. It is not an information line. The tip line is also staffed from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. seven days a week, and that number is 800-TIP-WDNR, or pound 367 from your U.S. cellular cell phone. And you can also text the tip to tip 411 or email a tip to le.hotline at wisconsin.gov. Okay, get out your answer sheets and get ready to see how you did. Here are the correct answers in our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. Question 1. How tall is an adult Wisconsin Whitetail at the shoulder? The correct answer is B, 36 inches to 42 inches. Question two, which of a deer's senses is the weakest? The correct answer is A, sight. Question three, how fast can a deer run? The correct answer is C, 30 miles an hour or more. Question four, bucks communicate by emitting scent from which glands? The correct answer is both A and B, orbital and tarsal. Give yourself half credit if you got one right. Question five, what influences a buck's antler development? The correct answer is D, all of the above, the deer's age, genetics, and nutrition. Question six, how long is a white-tailed doe's gestation period? The correct answer is B, six and a half months. Question seven, a doe must be at least one year old to breed, true or false? The correct answer is false. Some doe fawns may breed as early as seven months, especially in southern Wisconsin. Question eight, deer population goals for Wisconsin's deer management units consider which of the following? The correct answer is D, all of the above ecological carrying capacity of the landscape, social tolerance for deer, and hunting and recreational interests. Okay, now add up your score. How did you do? If you got zero to three correct, well, you're a greenhorn, but we hope you've learned something on this show. If you got four to six correct, congratulations. Consider yourself a hunter. And if you got seven or eight correct, Hey, you're an expert. Maybe you should be a guest on next year's show. Thanks for taking our Wisconsin Whitetail Quiz. Now back to the show. Wow, I see the rest of the gang's already here. Hey, Dan. Grab a chair. Oh, thanks. Hi, Dan. How are you doing, Hi, Carl? Dan. Nice Hi, Joni. Hey, Jeff. Hi, Carl. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Hey, Joni. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Well, folks, remember, if you're planning on building a campfire or using a wood stove, don't bring firewood from home. Cut it or buy it locally. And that way you avoid transporting emerald ash borers and other disease-bearing critters into new areas. Say, Jeff, you've been hunting for a long time. How'd you get started? Well, Dan, I'm very fortunate that my father was a hunter and a great teacher. And when I was six years old, he invited me to go duck hunting, tag along with him. We hunted right here in Wisconsin. And that positive impression of hunting, the sunrise, the ducks flying, the sound of shotguns, bagging ducks, actually having a duck in my hand, seeing the beauty of the duck, oh, yeah. seeing the interaction between the hunters and their dogs, even at age six, left a very, very strong impression on my mind and really helped me appreciate nature even more. So why do you still hunt? Well, the reason I hunt now is a lot different than say 20 or 30 years ago. Back then it was how many can I get and really what size was it? But now it's a lot different. I truly enjoy eating wild meat and I want to bag something. But this morning we shared a sunrise together. This campfire right here, I was born a couple days ago. I didn't see a deer. 
but I saw a beautiful red fox. A fantastic experience. And the experience of being in the outdoors and seeing different things so that surprise you and that you enjoy, it's really a big part of the hunt. Again, enjoy eating wild game, but the event is, and the hunt is not dictated by what you bring home in the bag. It's just the experience of enjoying all of our company and really being with people who you want to be with. Absolutely. Now you've had a lot of memorable hunts. Why don't you tell us about one? Well, I've been fortunate to have quite a few of them. Recently, I was hunting for white-tailed deer during the rut, and I had a really a good buck come about 20 yards away, come broadside, but there was a bush between myself and the buck. Well, I pulled the bow back, and the buck just stood there. Well, for about 20 seconds, it stood there, and it could have gone to the left for an open shot, but instead, it walked straight ahead. So it kept the, the big bush and myself, and I didn't get a shot at the buck. It wasn't an ethical shot. It would not have been a good shot. So the buck walked away. So I came back the following spring, this past spring, and what would you guess was beneath my tree stand? Oh, man. One of his antlers. It was a very distinctive antler. It was exactly beneath my tree stand, and that was a special thing. <laughs> no kidding. Well, Joni, how'd you get started? Well, actually, Dan, when I was in my 30s, I moved from Milwaukee out to Waukesha, and I started working at a gun club and started talking to a lot of the shooters and some of the employees, and they were telling me about their hunting adventures, and they got me interested in taking hunter safety, of course, because that's the most important thing to take. And since then, I have gone on deer hunting, caribou, black bear hunting, been doing it for the last 20 plus years. Wow, and, yeah. and what does uh, hunting mean to you now? Oh, hunting to me is an adventure. I mean, every time you go, you see something different. Um, I bow hunt, I just started that a couple years ago, and uh, two weeks ago I was lucky enough to see a fish under my stand. Wow. So that was, that was actually kind of neat. I've never seen, you know, other things than deer and the squirrels, but actually a fisher, mm -hmm. and rumor has it now where I hunt, we actually have bobcat up by us, so. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed very much. Okay, I'll bet you got a memorable hunt story you oh, can share. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> sitting around the campfire, <laughs> you always have good stories. Well, a couple years ago, I had shot a beautiful eight-point buck. It was about 75 yards from my stand. And as I shot it, it spun around and took off. And I thought, oh no. So I called my husband, because I wasn't sure whether or not I should look for it right away. So he said, well, wait for a while, come on down, take a look, you know, look for it. So about 15, minute later, 15 minutes later, I had looked, and sure enough, I found the blood trail and found my deer, and I actually got to tra or track my first deer, so I thought that was like my best experience I ever could have as a hunter. Wow, that's great. Well, Carl, how'd you get started? Well, Dan, I was lucky enough to grow up in the northern lower peninsula of Michigan, and the backyard was just my playground. We had a lot of land to run around on, and I had a little brother to play out in the woods with, but. As much time as my family spent outdoors, we didn't hunt. Uh, when I was in school, though, I met some other kids that were hunters and whose families took them hunting, and I was lucky enough to go along. Um, actually, my first hunt was goose hunting, and although I didn't have a, a shotgun in my, in my lap while I was laying in the field, it was an experience I will never forget. We had some geese that were just about to land on my chest. I got to do some calling with the goose call, and I was just an observer, you know, but hearing the wings whistling while they were coming down, and calling a little bit and seeing my friends get some geese, I was hooked. And that year I took hunter safety and I've been a crazy hunter since, man. I'll tell I you guess, what. yeah. <laughs> so, so what does hunting mean to you now? Well, that's a really tough question to answer because there are a lot of reasons that I really enjoy hunting. But one of the most basic ones is the food aspect of it. We've got a, a freezer at home that we like to keep well stocked with venison and ducks and pheasants and geese, grouse, all that sort of stuff. And we don't buy a whole lot of meat at the store. Um, being able to go into that freezer and pull out a nice venison steak or something like that, it, you know, that's to me as good as food can get. Free range, organic, natural as can be. But this time of year with the deer hunt especially, it's that annual tradition of being together with your friends and your family, um, sitting around the fire, thinking about what you're gonna do, telling stories, telling jokes. You know, the combination of those things just make it my favorite thing to do. And I imagine you've had a few memorable hunts. <laughs> I'll tell you what, those memories stick with you and you just can't forget. I'm, almost every hunt is really memorable like that, but there was a, a great hunt last year on opening day. Um, you know, the, the hunts that really stick with you tend to be the ones where the deer got away. 
And last year we had a hunt where um, my buddy was hunting very close to a youth hunter who was out with his dad. And uh, there was a really nice buck that made its way to this young hunter. But what's interesting about that story is that that deer had to walk past another member of our deer camp to get to the young guy. And that hunter let the deer pass, thinking that the young fellow might get a shot at it. So I thought that was pretty impressive. But what also impressed me is that this young hunter, he didn't force a shot when the deer came in. He just didn't feel right about it, so he didn't pull the trigger. And that buck has kind of become, you know, the legend of our deer camp. Old mossy horns, the ghost buck. It seems like every deer camp's got one of those that, that gets away. And the story at the end of that day was just phenomenal, hearing that young, young fella tell it. You know, yeah. tell what he saw. Pretty cool. Also didn't hurt that my little brother and I got to drag his first buck out together. All right. Pretty memorable. <laughs> Great story. <laughs> well, I've had some memorable hunts too, but I hope my most memorable hunt is my next one. And I hope that's the case for you too. Well, that brings us to the end of another deer hunting special. We hope you've enjoyed the show and hope you've learned something new, even if you're no stranger to the deer woods. For the rest of the gang, I'm Dan Small. Have a safe and successful deer season, and thanks for joining us. Well, I think we better.